perspective of how they achieved it. I don't want to be misunderstood. Uh, paint, uh, uh, painting too rosy a picture of the past is characteristic of people of a certain age. And I, I don't want to fall into such an obvious trap. Uh, I don't claim that politicians were more honest and society more just in 1956. America has made great progress since then in transparency, accountability, and social equality. But there has been a, a remarkable transformation in what I believe uh, in, in, in is the behavior of, uh, of what is socially acceptable and even admirable uh, due to the rise of market fundamentalism. I describe it a, as a decline in public morality in a very special sense by contrasting it with the amorality of market values. I define market fundamentalism as the undue extension of market values to other spheres of social life, notably politics. Economic theory claims that in conditions of general equilibrium, the invisible hand assures the optimum allocation of resources. This means that people pursuing their self-interest are indirectly also serving the public interest. It gives self-interest and the profit motive a moral imprimatur, which allows them to repl replace virtues like honesty, integrity, and concern for others. The argument is invalid on several counts. First, financial markets don't tend towards equilibrium. General equilibrium theory reached this, its conclusion by taking the conditions of supply and demand as independently given. The in invisible hand of the market then brings supply and demand into equilibrium. This approach ignores the reflexive feedback loops between market prices and the underlying conditions of supply and demand. It also ignores the visible hand of the political process, which lies hidden behind the market mechanism. Second, the general equilibrium theory takes the initial allocation of resources as given. This rules out any consideration of social justice. Most importantly, the theory assumes that people know what their self-interest is and how best to pursue it. In reality, there is a significant gap between what people think and what the facts are. Nevertheless, market fundamentalism has emerged triumphant. How could that happen? One reason is that the main policy implication of market fundamentalism, that government interference in the economy should be kept to a minimum, is not as unsound as the arguments employed to justify it. The market mechanism may be flawed, but, but the political process is even more so. Participants in the political process are even more fallible than market participants because politics revolve around social values, whereas markets uh, uh, take the, uh, the participants' values as given. As we have seen, social values are highly susceptible to manipulation. Moreover, politics are poisoned by the agency problem. To guard against the agency problem, all kinds of safeguards have to be introduced, and this makes the behavior of governmental agencies in the economic sphere much more rigid and bureaucratic than the behavior of private participants. On all these grounds, it makes sense to argue that governmental interference in the economy should be kept to a minimum. So market fundamentalism 
has merely substituted an invalid argument for what could have been a much stronger one. It could have argued that all human constructs are imperfect and social choices involve choosing the lesser evil. And on those grounds, government intervention in the economy should be kept to a minimum. That would have been a reasonable position. Instead, it claimed that the failures of government intervention proved that the free markets are perfect. And that's simply bad logic. I want to make myself quite clear. I condemn market fundamentalism as a false and dangerous doctrine. But I'm in favor of keeping government intervention and regulations to a minimum for other and better reasons. Uh, by far the most powerful force working in favor of market fundamentalism is that it serves the self-interest of the owners and managers of capital. The distribution of wealth is taken as given and the pursuit of self-interest is found to serve the common interest. What more could those who are in control of capital ask for? They constitute a wealthy and powerful group, well positioned to promote market fundamentalism, not only by cognitive argument, but by the active manipulation of public opinion. Market fundamentalism endows them at the market mechanism, which is amoral by nature, with a moral character, and turns the pursuit of self-interest into a civic virtue similar to the pursuit of truth. It has prevailed by the force of manipulation, not by the force of reason. It's supported by a powerful and well-financed propaganda machine, which distorts the public's understanding of its own self-interest. For example, how, could the, how else uh, could the campaign to repeal the estate tax which applies only to an elite 1% of the population, have been so successful. <clears throat> there are, of course, uh, competing forces uh, in the political arena that use similar methods of manipulation, but they tend to be less well-financed because they can't draw on the self-interest of the wealthiest and most powerful segment of the population. That's how uh, market ma uh, fundamentalism has emerged triumphant in the last 25 years. And even the financial crisis was not sufficient to impair its influence. This was demonstrated by President Obama's decision to avoid recapitalizing the banks in a way that would have given the government majority control. 